Thank you. So my, my goal today is to outline a few ideas that I have been playing with in this area of smart studies and how is the nature of our studies as an artifact and also how we go about designing and planning them uh, as processes. How are they undergoing very, very fundamental changes due to the access of technologies. In order to do that, I will hopefully go through this agenda. Now, in, in all fairness, I very rarely stick to an agenda. So we may get through half of this, and uh, then we may t talk about other issues. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, I enjoy getting questions as we go through the, the presentation rather than trying to keep everything to the end. Um, so it's important that I share with you a little bit about how did I arrive at this topic because how I arrived at it plays a quite critical role in how I see things. My original academic training and everything was from a school of, of management where I was focused on learning how do these large information technologies transform organizations. And very, very specifically, how do they transform organizations in the ability of the organization to move information and knowledge for the purposes of high-end innovation. So how were individuals using email, how were people using intranets to really drive how did the organization innovate. And as I began to explore a fair amount of organizations, I realized very quickly that the role of technology was not that important. You could have the greatest intranet, you could have the greatest technology, you throw it in the wrong organization and it wouldn't make a damn difference. And organizations that just went out and spent a lot of money w would never get the results. Then a colleague of mine uh, told me, Kevin, why don't you examine the public sector? And I said, why do I even care? Well, the public sector on average spends twice or three times the amount that the private sector does on technology. Think about that for a second. Think about how much money the Department of Defense spends on technology. Think about any other department. They spend a lot of money on technology. As you'll see later on in my slides, the public sector has a hopeless record at getting any technology project completed on time, on budget, and there are a lot of reasons why. So I began playing around with the role of technology in the public sector, and then about three years back, we saw this big wave. And the wave came in terms of about three years back, you had unprecedented, unprecedented mobile access. And a lot of the application platforms and a lot of the development environments was stable enough to encourage everyday citizens to begin to develop apps and you had platforms and markets in place where everyday citizens could take technology and become their own entrepreneurs. That wave, to me, the, the most critical element of that is how is that going to change us society? How is that going to impact how we do things? And so for the last about three years, I've been focused on the role of technology in how does it enable us to change our governance process? How does it enable us to change how we plan and how we design our societies? So I have a 
word up there, challenge.gov. How many of you have heard of challenge.gov? One, two, three, four, five. So slowly we'll get more. If you haven't heard of challenge.gov, challenge go and hear about it. Go online and look up challenge.gov. So challenge.gov came into operation a few years back, and today it's one of the most vibrant crowdsourcing platforms for federal agencies to involve everyday citizens, the private sector, the NGO space, to solve problems. Okay? Through a grant from IBM, I was able to examine the range of competitions that will run on these platforms, talk to app developers, talk to people who hosted these, these challenges, and I'll share a few of those results later on. In terms of information systems and how I see governance and smart cities, as I noted early on, there are two distinct ways I operate with these things. One is as the artifact. Okay, so we all interact with things. A city, a town, a campus can be viewed as a noun, as a thing. Okay, and we can decide how we design these things. And for about a year, I had the pleasure of having an appointment in a school of architecture where I had a lot of colleagues who were interested in the thing and how does the thing interact with its environment. In today's world, we don't have to depend on others to create things that have longevity in our cities. Prior to the technology revolution, okay, most of the things that were designed was most of them, not all of them, most of them originated out of central plans, out of central structures. Today, the nature of how we design things and install them in our environments has changed. The process of how we engage the community in the design process for our cities is undergoing a lot of change as well. And I'll highlight a few examples later on. The, the role of technology today, one of the most interesting aspects of it, is today we don't have to guess about the future. For, to a large degree, we do not have to guess. As an example, how many of you have played around with agent-based models? One, two, three. Today, right? If, if you began playing with agent-based models, let's say, five years back, they were very, very hard to work with. Today, they're easier to work with. Five years back, we in the research community struggled with how to validate them, how to appreciate them, so on and so forth. Today, the use of agent-based models and simulation environments are part and parcel of most design elements when you think about planning cities and especially smart cities. So I gave you the, that background to basically give you my lens of how I view these problems. So it's a very, very engineering, IS driven lens. So most of you pretty much know everything on this slide. right? We are moving very, very radically towards mega cities as our the dominant um, structure. We have large, large cities that are being constructed, being built, and most of them. So the last point is probably the most important one. Most of our future mega cities are not in places we know a lot about. We don't know a lot about 
a lot of these areas in terms of infrastructures, in terms of policy development, in terms of governance structures, and many of these places are highly unstable as well. So if you look at If you look at various numbers, okay, we are about seven billion individuals in the world, one billion cars, and you can just go online and get all the numbers you need. Most dense mega cities, and you can see them, they're all getting concentrated in a few areas. This is all data. If you were to chart mega cities in 2025, if you trust predictions, this is what the world would look like. This is not my prediction, this is somebody else's. Uh, but you notice a few trends. You, you, you see things happen. If you look at the literature and the practice on smart cities, about 99.9% .9 of it is focused on those large bubbles that I talked about or I showed on the map or the major mega cities of today. If you think about New York, London, so on and so forth. A lot of the literature is around that. And what I want to do is give you a vision. This is an idea on what I think mega, uh, a smart city needs to have. And we will go through each one in some detail throughout this presentation. But I just want to throw this up here for a minute. Does anybody have anything to add to this? Anybody disagree? Anybody wants to change something? Just as with any outline, this is half wrong and half right. Yes, sir. Okay, let me go back. Why? Well, there's a very easy answer to that and a more difficult answer. The easy answer is the reproduction rate. It's very high in India and China. I mean, I mean, people are reproducing at a very, very high rate compared to the rest of the world, uh, especially India. China is not so. The, the, the other reason that people attribute to large population growth, our level of education, you know, the role of women in, in society. I mean, there are a number of reasons that drive population growth. But, okay. So I outlined this vision. And basically, this vision grew out of a whole series of meetings with a lot of city managers and city planners where I went to them and I asked them, when you hear the word smart city, what comes to mind? Okay. Now, let me give you an illustration of why the word smart city gets interesting. This is from IBM. So IBM did a study in 2011 and they try to calculate the pain a commuter feels in a given city. So you see, Mexico City, Beijing, Nairobi, Johannesburg, so on and so forth. And then you have the other cities on the other side. Having lived in 
Chicago for nine years. I'm not sure 25 is accurate, but, you know, that's what they think it is. But I guess compared to Johannesburg, maybe. But this is what IBM calculated. The amount of pain a commuter feels. Soon I'll get the hang of this. Depending on your mindset, each of these interventions would consider or would be applicable if you thought about an intervention to make a city smarter in terms of transport. London introduced the congestion charge to change transport behavior. Singapore introduced smart metering and tolling. That's considered a smart city intervention. Vienna just started adding more bicycle lanes and removing car lanes. That's a smart city intervention. And then you have San Francisco's bike coalition. Another example. So you can take any issue of a city and the minute you begin to tease it apart you will find just about any intervention gets classified into a smart city thing. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with everything? Right, so drawing lines becomes very, very tricky, right? On the one hand, if you ask the IBMs and the Siemens, they would tell you everything to do with technology is smart. If you talk to public agencies and local governments, to them, as we did our research, the minute they hear about the words sustainability, smartness, resonates with them. If you talk about young citizens, they, they think about information provision as their dominant variable when they think about smart. So the number of apps to, uh, to any college going student, I would hypothesize that if a city had more apps, you're probably going to get them to think it's smart. So so one of the big, big issues in the literature and practice is you can take just about any dimension of a city's operation and you can collect a range of examples from highly technology to economic incentive issues to infrastructure, as in the case of Vienna, to just civic action, and they all fall into this category of making things smarter, okay? Now, <coughs> because of the range of those examples, my personal view, which is the answer to the question I was asked, is you, I don't believe any city is dumb, right? A city by its very existence, have to, has to have some level of intelligence, smartness. So the question is not smart cities or not smart cities. The question is how do we take existing things and make them smarter, if that's how you want to frame them, or what are the range of interventions that you can use? In my view, technology is one of many interventions. And as I'll show you through examples, technology without process interventions are almost always useless. We can have a lot of apps, a lot of platforms, a lot of sensors. If the process and the governance is not accounted for, we just are paying a lot of money to construct technology. So it's important to appreciate cities, especially if you want to make them smarter, 
as very, very complex ecosystems. Let me go back. So, very, very basically, if you break down any city and you view it from uh, a complex ecosystem and there's a growing literature today on complex adaptive systems of systems, you will see that a city has few very discernible elements. You have agents, you have objects, and you have platforms. Hopefully the agents, objects, and platforms are all in, a, in an environment because they choose to be there. Everything on the lower end of that slide in terms of the features are how these things operate. Okay? You have local control, you have emergent structures, you have each element being goal directed on their own. You have environments that are influenced and the s systems that influence them. And you have a lot of information exchange that happens in these environments. If you just stripped away and viewed cities in the abstract, you would see them as these. Okay? Given this view, okay, how do our current planning and design approaches account for them? How do they account for them? If we want to make something smarter, we have to intervene. We have to do something to move it from state A to state B. Most researchers and practitioners, if you got them in a room and asked them to describe the elements of a city, would list all of these things. If you view them as that, most of our planning and design approaches unfortunately don't account for these things. Can anybody give me an example of a planning and design approach that accounts for most of these? This is the Q&A part where I get to drink water. We love reductionism. We love it. We try to account for everything in a plan. We try to build grand plans. We try to build mega cities. When we know this is how in reality things operate. In my research group, this, these are the imperatives that we are trying to build on as we conduct our research and build s solutions. One is, for every project, we try to embrace complexity. Rather than trying to say complexity is an error term or we don't understand it and so we'll leave it to a side or let's have all these assumptions and then come up with an answer, we try our hardest to model complexity. Okay. Any intervention that you think about that has some ability to make a city smarter has to, in some way, increase the situational awareness of the various elements. You are either trying to increase the amount of information, relevant information, not just any information, relevant information one element has about how their behavior impacts others. Other ways you can make things smarter if you adopt the complex adaptive system view is you create emergent platforms for decision making. You have to build cities where rather than trying to plan every single thing or, or institutions, you must allow for emergent platforms to, to originate. 
and I'll share examples of these. Leverage technologies is obviously important, okay? I'm not saying technology is not important, but it's more important that the technologies are plug and play. Okay? But it's more important that the technologies are plug and play. How many of you have done any reading on the Dreamliner? Boeing's Dreamliner? So, if you think about that project, okay, it was a fairly complex undertaking. Actually, it still is a complex undertaking. It's not yet done. Right? And what did they want to do? They, they actually wanted to build the airplane with complete appreciation of complexity. So on the one hand, I have to go to them and say, you guys are geniuses. Rather than Boeing designing the chairs or the TV screens or any other element of the airplane, Boeing went to the chair designers and said, you know how to make chairs, make the best chair. You know how to make the best screens, make the best screens. And Boeing assumed one thing that we all take for granted, plug and play. Meaning all of these independent things would come together and Boeing would assemble it, kind of like how we build computers, and it would fly. As you know, there's been a lot of problems with that. But its approach is one where I recommend anybody who has any free time read about it because that's what's going to be required to really build smarter cities. We have to think about how we enable for plug and play to happen. Today, most cities do not have opportunities for citizens to plug their information in readily, plug their devices in, plug their ideas in, and those that are making headway in those areas are struggling with what to do with those inputs. Okay, so the plug and play aspect becomes very important. And lastly, if you really want to appreciate the whole bottom up and lack of central control, you really need to enable ways for those living in a city to actually actively participate in its construction, maintenance, implementations, building. So if you were to go home and ask yourself, how many times did you actively participate in the design of your city? How many instances, who do you recall? Not that many. Not that many. Most of us are passive residents. We use our home, we design our home, we don't care about the next home. Right? In a complex adaptive system model, you can't do that. You design your home and you design your home so well that you consume all the resources, eventually your home is not going to be that good. It may take some time for that feedback to materialize. So how do we enable citizens oops, sorry, to be active participants? Is, so these are our imperatives that we are working off of as we try to conduct research and projects around smarter cities and urbanization. So let me give you a few examples. Now, in the interest of time, I will not be able to get through every research project because I've chosen a few examples. But I'd be glad to chat afterwards. You can email me. I have all the articles. You can read them. Uh, we can Skype. We can do a whole group of things. So. I apologize in advance if I don't get into the nitty gritties. So I already know of Jennifer's work around apps and mobile apps and everything. So we also did a project while I was at 
Progenia Tech. We examined the whole group of apps as well. And most, if you see on this end, um, there we go, all of this stuff, you will find apps in just about every aspect of what would be considered urban management, policy, or local government, just about everything. Okay? For example, transparency and corruption. Let me just give you one example. Okay? In India, in one of the mega, uh, in one country that has, that has one of the highest growth rates of mega cities in the future, corruption is very, very high. So a nonprofit created an app. It's called IPAB. I paid a bribe. It's a cool app. You should go check it out. So basically, if you go into a government office or a public agency or you deal with any civil servant and you pay a bribe to get a particular transaction completed, you can go online and say, I went to this agency, I wanted to do this, this is how much the bribe. So it serves one, you are reporting it, plus two, you don't want other people to pay more than the going rate. So if the going rate for this transaction is 100 rupees, and you have an officer saying, well, give me 400, you can say to them, no, look, it's 100. The going rate is 100. The, the other reason why it's very important is if you went to the bank, withdrew money, right, and then you went to do your transaction, and the person didn't accept money, you can also report that. So in, in India, a nonprofit constructed this. You have apps. So f for example, in transportation, uh, when I was at the University of Washington, a few students that were joined from the information school and computer science created the One Bus Away app. Okay, where they basically took advantage of GPS data that's on buses so that you don't have to wait in the rain. It's a very simple problem and they built an app. So you have a whole collection of apps. What we did was we wanted to see what were they doing and how were they being built and why. Most apps took advantage of either user feeds, meaning like in the I paid a bribe, that was a user feed app. You have to input information in order to get any value from it. Or they took advantage of government data or a combination of the two. Most apps had goals that are noted there. As we began to tease away at these apps, we became very curious about one thing. Why would a person develop an app? How many of you have developed apps? One, two. Why did you develop your app? What was your motiv motivation? Entertainment. There was another hand somewhere up there. That hand went away. Okay. Motivation, entertainment, what we found is basically this. Be there were agencies that gave out little prizes that got individuals moving. So, for example, the most notable one is the competition that was run in D.C., where they opened up data and they gave out prizes. Small, small amount. 2,000, 5,000. The other ones, they were just civic activists that wanted to solve a problem. And the third one 
we found a lot of developers who build the original app because they thought they're going to make money. They were going to open a business, open everything else. Unfortunately, for a lot of those, they haven't made money yet. Okay? So we, we began this project as our first input into try to understand how is the democratization of technology, how is it transforming things? Now, a few things we found that are worth remembering now, and I will build on these. One, how many of you have heard of the long tail effect? You know the long tail? It's very true for apps. What does that mean? Most apps, most apps have very few users, very few usage. There's a long tail effect if you look at apps in general, and especially apps around urban governance, and let's use that word, that basically captures all of this. You always have a long tail. Number two, the other thing we found, and if you go on my website, I have even copied, a f or not copied, I have made available a few of our interview transcripts, and then you can just read them. Um, we found a lot of competition among developers. So if I'm developing an app to solve transportation, and he's developing an app to solve transportation, and he's developing an app, and we might be a block away. We are not talking to each other. As a result, as a result, most app developers give up after the first failure. There's no environments right now that are in place to promote lesson sharing, knowledge sharing around app development for governance. And I'm being very, very specific around governance. Whereas if you look at other kinds of app development, there are user groups, there are user nets, there are other uh, platforms that are promoting exchanges. So if you look at the biomedical community, okay, where a lot of the data is being made available, open, large-scale data, there are forums for people to share. In this place, there's very little. Okay? So we found a few interesting things that led us to this one. So we, so we looked at what are citizens doing, and then we began to tackle the issue of how is inputs translating into action, okay? How are any of these technologies actually making a difference? And what we found is you can categorize most apps and platforms where you have citizens collaborating to solve urban governance problems in these four categories, okay? So the first one is where you have a group of local citizens coming together and they're sharing citizen data on an issue, okay? So in Massachusetts, as an example, there's a group called Local, I can never say the name, it's Local A-C-R-A-C-Y. Anybody want to try that? Local R-C, local crazy, whatever, local A-R-C-C-Y. Basically, it's a group that just wanted, it was two, two citizens that wanted a platform for people to share ideas, vote on them, discuss them, and then recommend them to the local government for implementation. In example number two, where you have a lot of development happening, is where you have citizens that take advantage of open data. So for example, in the Bay Area, okay, there's an app called Crime Spotting. It's an app and a web-based platform, crime spotting. Basically, it was taking the 
police feed data to give residents of Oakland and then later on San Francisco the ability to know crime data in their locality. So if there's an incident, how many incidences, statistics, so on and so forth. The really cool thing about that platform was, and this is an important thing to remember as we think about interventions, when the app was first beginning to be developed, the group had some discussions with the city government, made sure that the data was able to be imported, everything else, so on and so forth. The app became so popular that the city had more demand on its servers and everything else, and they decided to cut off the data feed. City decided to say, no, 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 let's cut the data feed. That lasted for about two weeks, and then they had to reopen the data feed. Why am I sharing that example? Most of the literature around smart cities assumes we can just do this and it's no cost. There are real resource costs if we want to make cities smarter. When any of these apps start to be developed, any of these platforms, especially if you're relying on traditional agency resources, to the average citizen, they don't think about the implications. They don't think about the demand. And most agencies today are opening up their data, and we will get to that. Most of them, and we have interviewed a lot of them, haven't thought about resource implications. Have not thought about resource implications. The third one is, and I've thrown this up there, Pick Up Austin is a good example of the third model. You see a lot of these now propping up, where the government creates the platform and citizens share information. If you were to guess, what's the big problem with this one? There's a big problem with this one. Depends on perspective. But close, close. People have to go there. It's actually people have to go there, and they do. They throw out a lot of ideas. All of you decide those ideas are wonderful. He's at Capitol Hill or the city hall or whatever building, and he thinks it's irrelevant. What, do, what does he do? Does he still implement them? Does he ignore them? Does he respond to them? And he's one. Everybody that provided an idea, what do they want? Feedback. He has to make a decision. Do I give feedback? Do I not give feedback? If I give feedback, what kind of feedback? If I give feedback, how does that interfere with a future contract bid? If I give feedback, can I enter into or can I get myself into a lawsuit? So as a result, I mean, these are serious, serious implications. There's a lot, these websites, these platforms, if you trace them, you will see something. Early on, a lot of activity, a lot of activity. Why? Because it's being talked about in the news media. The, the, the city may take out an ad in the local paper. You have a momentum. And a lot of citizens, and there's a beautiful book um, in which Clay Shirky talks about cognitive helpless. A lot of us want to change, want to help something change. So we get energized and we contribute, 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 and then the black box. The policy issue here 
is again, technology, very nice, but if the city didn't give him three other people to respond, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because now you've just aggravated everybody. Government-centric and citizen app model is very common. Okay, A lot of cities from sh Chicago to uh, Boston have all tried that, where they make data open available and they provide little incentives. And we'll talk about why or the critical issues around those in a minute. Okay? So open data, which is related to the last one. A lot of cities are opening this up. And as it's written right up there, and I have interviewed state CIOs on this and city CIOs, how many of them actually have a plan? That's why I call it, it's cool, you know. It's become very, very, if you don't do it now, this is where institutional theory comes in. It's, it's quite a nice thing if anybody wants to write their dissertation on. Today it's all about, let's just keep up with the Jones. People are opening data because it's fashionable. It's fashionable. People may read to you all of the right things that um, they claim that open data will do, like transparency, accountability, promote innovation, promote this, promote that. They don't have a plan. The flip side of doing that is wait and see, okay? And right now we have a lot of, lot of data related issues that unfortunately are just going to get intensified. Down here, talk about chief data officers. One project we are embarking on right now, how many cities have a chief data officer? How many cities have a chief data if you were a major company, would you not have a person in charge of your data if you're making it available, especially if you're making it available? How many cities have a chief data officer? San Francisco is trying to get one. Is trying to get one. They, the, the last year towards, um, I want to say October, they try to release a new open data policy, blah, blah, blah. The reason being, without dedicated resources, there's no guarantee data is protected. One. Most of the data being made open, okay, is being made open under the assumption there's no individual harm done to anybody. Okay, after the gun shooting, we saw what happens with open data, where maps were made. There's no security. There's, there's a lot of issues that, again, if you don't think about them, for, technology is not the problem. Okay, so I just want to get... Okay, so the other things... Cities are doing, which I'll wrap up with, is, is they're doing a lot of challenges and competitions. Take a minute to choose any two quotes and just read them and it'll pretty much make my point. And these are extracted directly from managers that have ran competitions to make their cities or towns smarter and they have open data and given You notice something? The 
there's a huge disconnect in the two groups. Huge. And these are people who actually won. Imagine those that lost. Managers have one mental schema when they're trying to make apps, platforms, data, every, all of these things available. And those are the things up. The people who actually do stuff, like this, we already talked about this one. Okay. So again, there's a lot of policy and governance issues that go beyond just having cool technology. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll just rush you through this one. Very quickly, the key point that I want to leave you with is technology without governance and policy. You're not going to get anything smarter. This is an example of what agencies are trying to do with technology today. And the numbers speak for themselves. Over three billion, not done, blah, blah, blah. Okay? I hate to end on such depressing, but in the duration of the project, see how many CIOs were changed. Every year, the government kept coming up to write a report. And trust me on this, if, e even if you can't read them, it was the same thing year and year after, and we still spent billions and billions of dollars on technology. Bottom line, we took open data, and this is very similar to anything if you just look at technology and smart. You begin with people talking with high confidence and high sentiment. And then over time, you notice the decline. And these were from just analyzing press releases doing traditional text mining. When these projects begin, people have it's going to change the world, and I completely believe it. As a project progresses, I don't think it's going to change the world, but I, I hope it doesn't harm the world, and I don't believe it. Okay? So with this, I'll end. I'll just leave this up. Um, but basically, bottom line being, our take on smart city design and planning is technology is absolutely wonderful. But if you don't account for everything else around the technology from a complex systems point of view, you're never going to make any headway in this. And here are a few ways I recommend that we do this. We have a couple, of, a couple minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. What questions do you have for Kevin? So right over here, right? So I think these three elements or these three design considerations need to be critical. Rather than thinking of designing something, so probably the best way to think about it is I call it the Google way. Everything is in beta. Everything is always in beta. Right? We have to take that approach. We, every time that I speak to people designing stuff, okay, they want the end product. They, they, they want it to be version one or version, 
Whereas if you assume everything you design is beta and through constant feedback, you'll eventually extend it, make it more flexible, I think you have a better chance. Is it easy to do? Absolutely not. But at least what we are trying to do is we are trying to launch platforms. So at ASU, we have a platform uh, and it's done in collaboration with Ashoka's Changemakers, where it's an ideation platform. And every, I guess it's every four months or so, we keep iterating with the feedback we get. And we're trying to learn and we're trying to, so rather than saying this is the platform and then, and we're involving our users in, in the next iterations. So it's a different way and especially if you're talking about smart cities, in order to do that, you need citizens to be active players in the design process rather than just recipients of it, which requires interventions on the policy side. And with that, I'd like us to give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.